Welcome to Wesley's channel and this is Wesley's news. Today I'm going to be talking about part number four of DALI, free energy device, no battery, no power supply. As all of the blocks of those concepts repeat themselves, it is important to understand how those blocks work. We not only have Ruslan, Akua, Anonymous, and others that are alike Dali, but plenty of others. I'm going to be having a discussion with the scientist, a person who spent most of his lifetime working for the government and military industry, who decided to share his knowledge with me discussing subject in question when we talk about a free energy free energy is the energy that must come from somewhere and be converted to usable form of the energy there is no free lunch but for me free energy is the energy that doesn't have to be paid for and I'm sure 100% that this kind of energy exists. So let's go to the discussion. You're going to be having a little problem to understand at the beginning of what my friend is talking about. But later on, you're going to adjust yourself, and it's going to be pretty clear. I have a question. You have a generator or transmitter connected to the coaxial cable. The coaxial cable is wired to the coil, whatever. The frequency could be any frequency, 150 megahertz or 150 kilohertz. Instead of having a resistor at the end of it that's 50 ohms, so uh, it would dissipate uh, as a hitch. You're closing it. What's going to happen to the signal there? Okay. You said instead of having a 50 ohm resistor that it don't talk energy as to heat, and then you said something else, I missed that. Do we keep the second half of that sentence, uh, Wes? you shorting the end. Okay. And all the possible resistors you can put on the end, everything from a short circuit, let's call it zero ohm, up to a complete open We're going to repeat that few times. The characteristic impedance of the cable. 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 If the resistor that is connected at the end of the coaxial cable is, let's say, 48, 49 ohms, that is lower than characteristic impedance of the cable, we're going to create a reflected wave back to the transmitter and standing wave as well. You're going to get the same amount of reflection, a very calculatable amount of reflection. Right. I'm going to show you right now the coaxial cable, only the inner wire with a piece of the insulation on it, which shows here on the right hand side, right, on the top, the forward wave and at the bottom, reflected wave. At the left upper corner, you can see the link to www.hamuniverse.com and you can read more about it. So, whether we short coaxial cable at the end or we short 300 ohm ladder line, which is our old 
flat cable from the TV, we're going to have a similar behavior. And yet, it will lead us to all of the B filler coils that we play with. So, depends on the shape of the transmission line, we have different impedance which would be the resistance to the particular frequency of wave and that will have a properties of capacitive and inductive reactance. Coaxial cable is made usually as 50 or 75 ohm of impedance. Flat transmission line could also be called twin lead. And that is the, uh, you know that the uh, 50 divided by 49 is a 1.1 or whatever it is standing wave ratio. And that can, you can then calculate exactly how much reflection you're going to get. And there's something else. A time domain reflectometer will tell you this one. Any amount of resistance, smaller than 50 ohm on a 50 ohm cable, is going to give you 180 degrees of phase shift on reflection. So lower in ohms, 180 degrees of phase shift. Higher in ohms, no phase shift, but still reflection. So uh, as you go to higher and higher number of ohms, you get more and more reflection. As you go to infinity, every bit of the signal you send down the cable reflects back to you. I'm assuming you have a frequency that's not so high with a little bit of semiconductor at the end starts acting like an antenna. You know, 10 gigs, you're going to get that effect. But uh, at normal HF frequencies, higher than 50 ohms, reflection. The higher the number of ohms, the more the amount of reflection. And you can get 100% reflection from an open circuit. You can get 100% reflection with 180 degrees of phase shift on a short circuit. Your TDR, by looking at the waveform on your TDR, and you look at the echo pulse, is it positive going or negative going? Tells you is the impedance at the end higher or lower. And uh, uh, the wave shape tells you whether or not there's any capacitance there. So you've got a lot of information on that oscilloscope screen of a time domain reflectometer that uses this phenomenon. So I, I know that this is the beginning of a question, and give us the rest of the question, uh, uh, Wes. Uh, inductive character, a uh, capacitive character, when it's happening? When I'm increasing uh, the frequency over the frequency of resonance of the coax. Okay, this is getting very close to one of my favorite puzzles of my 30 or so physics puzzles. And when I give this one to electrical engineers, a high percentage of them have trouble with it. And here's the way I word it. I've got a sealed box at the end of the cable. It's got a good connector going into a sealed box. And inside the box is a thoroughly shielded, perfect variable capacitor. So at my frequency of operation of my signal generator, I've carefully adjusted that capacitor so it has exactly 50 ohms of capacitor reactance. So I got a 50 ohm capacitor at the end of a 50 ohm cable. And I asked each of these electronic engineers Am I going to get any standing wave ratio, or am I going to get any reflection of signal? Will any of these signal be reflected back to the transmitter? Uh, at least three quarters of them will say, no, you've got a 50 ohm load at the end of a 50 ohm cable. They make the mistake of thinking a 50 ohm capacitor reactant is a good load on the end of a 50 ohm cable. The next question I ask them is that if it was a 50 ohm resistor, you know what's going to happen. All the signal you send down there gets absorbed by the 50 ohm dummy load, and none of it comes back. It gets turned into heat. Okay. I then ask him, if a 50 ohm capacitor is a perfect load, where does the energy go? And then you get a funny look on their face. Because you eventually, they eventually realize, whoa, you cannot put, you cannot continuously put energy of any kind into a pure capacitive reactance. You can put an amount of energy in there once. I, I mean, if the capacitor has got, uh, let me pick a number, 50 picofarad, and I put 50 volts on it, when I have CV squared, I can calculate the number of joules of stored energy in the capacitor as a one-time event. But if I'm putting a 50 ohm dummy load out there, and I run the transmitter for a year, that dummy load of 50 ohms will continuously absorb that energy for a year and turn it into heat. That capacitor at the end, maybe you could put some energy in there for a fraction of a second, but where is the energy going to go? A pure reactant is lossless. It cannot continuously absorb energy. So by definition, you put a pure reactant, capacitor, inductor, whichever, it has to reflect all of the energy you sent into it. It's going to create 
a savior in the process of doing it. It's going to change the wave shape you get on your time domain reflectometer in a very characteristic manner. That once you learn to do pattern recognition, you say, yeah, I know what that is. That's a capacitive load on the end of that cable. And by how much um, it gives you this effect, you can tell exactly how many uh, how many picofarads of capacitance it's got. So uh, a capacitor must reflect. If now you put a capacitor in series with a resistor, you're still going to get a phase shift, you're still going to get a reflection, and you're going to get a very predictable amount of reflection. I can tell you the equation that gives you the exact amount of reflection. But once you know the real impedance, and every real impedance is a resistive component and a reactive component. The resistive component is anything from zero to infinity. The reactive component is anything from minus infinity to plus infinity. And you represent that as a jump. You represent that as a complex number. R plus Jx, they call it. So the real impedance, if it's a series uh, reactor plus resistor, is called a R plus Jx. And if you put the two in parallel, there's a similar formula where you do it in uh, conductance instead of resistance. But still, what you know, what you represent it as a complex number, a real component plus a reactive component. Uh, the real component has nothing but a magnitude, a bad zero. Uh, and, oh, no, wait a minute now. You could have a negative resistance. There is something you can create a negative resistance electronically. Uh, but uh, you've got a resistive component, and then a J would be a, 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 the square root of 1 in front of the reactive component. And once you've got that representation, you plug it into a particular equation. That equation will tell you exactly what percentage of that energy is going to reflect back to you. And that equation will tell you exactly what phase angle is going to reflect. So as crazy as it sounds, it's a very deterministic situation. And you could say the, the whole philosophy of a vector network analyzer, the whole philosophy of the Smith chart, the whole philosophy of polar representation of RF energy is all based on that equation. That would be much more that we discussed that night with my friend. But it is enough for now for us to understand the basic phenomena of the magic coil. I call it magic coil because it's a special coil that utilizes coaxial cable, wind it like a coil, and short it at the end. At the same time, we might also be able to understand how bifilar coil works. And how shorted resonance circuit is interacting in within that big set of coils of Dali. As I said, if you look at that video, you will also recognize almost the same blocks of other experimenters who claim to have working free energy device, no battery, no power supply, and only one impulse to start. We're getting deeper and closer to inside of the processes of Dali device. Now we have a solid foundation to try to understand how he made it. In some of the oil countries, there are special institutions watching the market and all of the possible dangers that could be brought by the people like us. So at the beginning of those guys try to analyze whether they deal with an idiot or they deal with somebody who has an agenda to make money based on cheap revelation or whether the device is real and then who's standing behind the real danger to those people and those institutions are the people who don't care about the money 
they will make it anyhow when it pops out. Thank you very much, guys. This is Wesley, and it's Wesley's News. See you in part number five.